Welcome to yet another session of Concepts of Editing. We were talking about the creative role of the editor. And uh, we've already told you about certain principles of editing. That was during the sessions on basic concepts. I'd like to mention here that even when you apply those principles, there is a degree of creativity. And therefore, one editor's job will vary from an other editor's job. There will be a difference. And there's no right or wrong in cinema, as indeed in any creative activities. And there are no rules either. Rules are meant to be broken. But you need to know the rules in order to break them. This is very important. That's why we spoke about the imaginary line, about point of view shots, about subjective shots, about screen direction, and then came to the creative role of the editor, in which the editor sits in conjunction with the director, looks at the material provided by the cinematographer, and then decides where the cut is to be. In last episode, you uh, mentioned about non-diegetic sound. So I want to know more about it. Yes, I think that's an important question. Can one of you say what is diegesis? The story space. That's a good answer. That's one of the meanings. A diegesis may be defined as the total story space. Basically, to explain further, the diegesis is the total events shown in a story. And not only the events shown, but also all that is implied by that which is shown. You show certain events and you imply certain other events. Both of these constitute the diegesis. In semiological terms, in structuralist terms, we call it the sum total of all denotations. Now, what is non-diegetic sound? Sound which relates to the story space is diegetic, like the dialogue spoken by a character. Or if I place my pen, you know, here, there's a sound. That's diegetic. But there are several other kinds of sounds used in cinema which are non-diegetic. Can you give examples? Music. Music, for example. Voiceovers. Voiceovers, correct. Can a non-diegetic sound become a diegetic sound? Yes. You tell me how. When you listen to music but don't know the source, and when you saw the source that somebody is playing the music, then it becomes diegetic. Excellent. Music without a source would seem to be just like mood music, emphasizing a mood, or in counterpoint, as you said in an earlier session, contrapuntal. But the moment you perceive the source of that music, that music becomes diegetic. Can you give me an example which I gave you of a film in which you start off with thinking that the music is... Uh, non-diegetic, but it gradually becomes diegetic. Anyone? Please remember, Eight and a Half oh, by, Federico by Federico Fellini, film made in the early 60s, contains a scene in which you feel that the music by Nino Rota, the famous composer who also composed for Godfather, is non-diegetic. But then gradually you see the orchestra which is playing. That's an example of non-diegetic sound becoming diegetic. So, if there are no further questions, let me move forward with the class. Now, the creative role of the editor. We've talked about coverage, which is very important. We've talked about sound. We were talking about smoothness. How do we achieve this smoothness? Once again, the principles of editing come to the fore. If you maintain screen direction, if you maintain the imaginary line, if you, you know, effect proper match cuts, and if the pacing, timing, and rhythm of your film is correct, there's no correct in art, but more or less that which does not disturb, then you will have achieved smoothness. But in order to really communicate, it is this pacing, timing, and rhythm which are of paramount importance. We must try and understand what is pacing, what is timing, and what is rhythm. Now, the pace of a film could be determined in several ways. 
If we go back to Eisensteinian montage and look at metric montage, if we were to cut up shots with each shot having small durations, do you think the pace would be increased or decreased? If I cut more and I cut with each shot lasting for a very short time on the stream, what would I do with the pace? The pace would be increased. The pace would be increased. Because constantly you're cutting, you're adding more information, you're moving from one place to the other. This is the obvious. If I keep a shot on for a long time, obviously the pace would be reduced. But these are generalizations and may not always apply. In a Miklos Jancho film, you know, I've already spoken of him, the famous Hungarian filmmaker, films like Roundup and Hungarian Rhapsody, Allegro Barbaro, God Walks Backwards, and so on. Uh, Red Psalm. He doesn't cut much. In Electra, he probably uses only 12 or 13 cuts. But because the camera is frantically moving all the time, you don't feel that the pace is flagging. So at a simplistic level, it might seem that the more you cut, the more pace you get. But this may not always be the case. If within your frame you have a lot of action, that could also increase the pace. The pacing has to be decided by the editor and the director on the basis of content, on the basis of your story and your screenplay. Therefore, you can't always use the thumb rules. But in general, if you don't keep the shot longer than required, you will achieve a proper pace. I mean, once the shot information is conveyed, once the heightened drama has gone, if it's a melodrama, there's no point in keeping that shot on. For example, suppose we were being shot and I'm speaking. Even before the director says action, I would be getting ready. And then when he says action, I start speaking. You're not going to keep that part in which I'm waiting and the director has not said action. That's dead time. So when you pace, you must eliminate the dead time before a shot and also after the shot, after the shot because after the director says cut, it might take some time for the camera to be switched off. So there'll also be dead time and where I will not be giving proper expression. So you must get the shot to the right length and see that throughout the shot some information is being conveyed or some drama is being communicated. Some story element is being enhanced. Beyond that cut, that is again the Hollywood system. But again, there is a non-classical approach here. There are some filmmakers who would keep the shot on a trifle longer than necessary. Who would keep the shot on even after the principal characters have exited. After all the information has been conveyed. My question to you is, can you think of any director who does that? Michelangelo Antonioni. Yes, excellent. Why do you think he does that? Because I see his film uh, like Eclipse or Love like and Eclipse, Dura. yes. Why does he do that? He gives importance to the space, film space. Okay. I think that's very good. Good answer. Excellent, Mevdut. To put it in more cinematic terms, Antonioni emphasizes context over content. So even after characters leave the frame, he'll keep it on. You'll find in La Notte, the night, there's a famous sequence. There is this girl in the mental asylum who suddenly comes out and makes an overture to, you know, the principal character that is uh, Marcello Mastroianni. And you see her framed against the white background of that hospital. And you can feel her loneliness. As you say, Antonioni uses space. He uses architectonics. He uses architectural metaphor. And that's why he keeps the frame on longer. He emphasizes context over content. He may even leave a character. He may encourage the characters to leave the frame. So therefore, he's not a Hollywood-style editor. I mean, his editor is not. Ozu also does the same. Ozu will emphasize a space and then characters will come into that space. So he also, his pacing will be quite different. So the pacing of one director will vary from another.
there will be a change. Say, for example, a Shoto Yitrai would cut more according to Hollywood, although he would have an Indian meditative temperament and a philosophy. But he would certainly be different from, let's say, an Ozu or a Tarkovsky, who also would keep on a frame a trifle longer. The next point in my discussion on uh, the, credit, uh, the creative role of the editor, and that is timing. You've already spoken about pacing. Now, timing is not simply that of the actor. We often say that uh, the actor has to deliver his lines at the right moment. Chaplin is the master of timing. You know, at the right moment in modern times, in The Great Dictator, he does a gag, and it's very funny. Editors also must have a sense of timing. This is very important. That is, in a comedy sequence, if I've given a particular line, the next line, which is the punch line, has to come at the right moment. If it comes late, the joke will fall flat. If it comes early, the audience will not comprehend. For example, let me give you some lines from the Marx Brothers, which are also equally funny. The trick is, you have Groucho and Chico speaking. You have to cut the shot at the right moment. Have you seen the Marx Brothers? Yes, sir. Which films have you seen? I don't remember those names, sir. But you've seen in your classes. Okay. So you know, the four brothers. Uh, they're not five. You know, the fifth is Carl, but he's not one of their brothers. Anyway, so there's Groucho, Chico, Hi. Zeppo, and Harpo. Groucho and Chico are speaking. There are two shots. Groucho speaks, Chico answers. Groucho speaks, Chico answers. The timing is important. Groucho says, I got to pay my taxes. Cut. Yeah, that's where my brother lives. Taxes. Then no, no, no. I don't mean that taxes. I mean, I got to pay my taxes. I mean, money, dollars. Yeah, that's where he lives. Dallas, Texas. <laughs> the fun is that it has to be cut at the right point. He says, Dallas. He says, yeah, Dallas, Texas. That's where he lives. You understand? So it's typical American wit, but it is cut in a particular way. One shot has to follow another shot. Only then will the timing be correct. This applies not only in comedy, in drama, in melodrama, for example. You know, if you see Devdas, whether you see Sanjay Dila Bansali's Devdas, or you see Pramotesh Borua's Devdas, or you see Bimal Roy's Devdas, melodrama is at the core of this film. And this melodrama will come across only if the editor's timing is correct. You may shoot a film brilliantly. The photography may be outstanding. The director may be wonderful in his handling of actors. The performances may be brilliant. But if it's edited wrongly, the entire film will be ruined. The film will seem to be dragging, going on and on. Or it will seem to be so fast that you can't understand. So it's the timing that is extremely important in a film. An editor can spoil a film, mind you. It's very important. For example, where can he spoil the film? This is very important so far as the creativity of the editors. First of all, he could choose the wrong takes. The director has certain takes in mind. He's taken three, four takes. Three was the correct take or four was the correct take. If he takes take two, he takes the wrong takes. He could keep a shot on longer than is required, and thus the pace would flag, and thus he could spoil the film. He could cut the film so fast, you know, you know, like, like a Wild West fast draw, if he starts cutting like that. I mean, you can't use, let's say, the cutting of, uh, say, a stagecoach in a Devdas. You understand? The pacing of the content is important. Look at the Wild West film. Stagecoach was still early and it is slightly slow. But if you take a film like Red River, you know, or uh, Magnificent Seven. The Magnificent Seven or El Dorado, for example, a Howard Hawks film starring John Wayne and Robert Mitchum, it's differently paced. It's full of these quick draws and fast moving and horseback and all that. But Devdas is languorous. It has to move in that way. You must be very conscious about timing. Keep the shot on for just that much and no more. No less either. Keep it on for that much.
also remember now that we're in the world of cinema scope i've talked a lot about video and three camera setups and i've said that the imaginary line is so important in three camera setups but apart from video in film also we are moving into very high technology zones in just cinema for example we're now in the world of digital intermediate the titanic which uses visual compositing you know you visually composed the, that you know ship breaking down in this age in which the technology is really moving your editing has to be really perfect and it's not just editing of pictures anymore it's editing of pictures it's editing of sound and it's editing of graphics even these animation processes which are created now earlier on we used to think that animation was all cartoon animation you know like Walt Disney and Donald Duck but now animation is realistic you're actually creating a ship which is breaking down by digital intermediate you can do wonders star wars yes those are again special effects but things which are not special effects for example in a face off you know you could really place my face in your body and make it look real so for that also you have to edit it precisely you must have the frames at your fingertips one frame here or there will create problems when you use cinema scope for example cinema scope which is 1 is to 2.33 it's a complete long picture which is filling the screen if the film is so big then you need certain time for you to absorb the visuals therefore a long shot as i said earlier needs to be kept on for some time you just can't cut like that you have to see whether you're really getting the information particularly in cinema scope formats that's very important so keeping a long shot on for a certain time keeping a close up for only that much which is required and the use of the close up for example nowadays not really coverage but we take a whole scene in a master shot sometimes and then we take close ups this was griffith system of working the option whether to use the close up or not to use the close up that's again a creative decision a very important creative decision if you use the close up you emphasize the drama you bring a certain point to the fore but if you use too many close up you lose sight of the context and antonioni would not use so many close ups a tarkovsky would not nor would a nozu but they might use some close ups but if you fill up the screen with close ups you might get a bergman film like scenes from a marriage and there is a purpose to those close ups he is filming drama pure raw gritty drama somewhat in the fashion of that eugene o'neil play long day's journey into night which was made into a marvelous film by sydney lumet so it's drama it's a husband and a wife quarreling with each other biting into each other liv ulman and erlan josephson crying out at each other and that's why you need the close ups there's no music at all in scenes from a marriage it's a mid 70s film but in a tarkovsky film in which the atmosphere is so important there are religious connotations you require a space and you require that the camera should glide so there are differences but the creative decision is the editors whether to use the close up or not to use the close ups how many close ups to use for what length will the close ups remain these are very important creative decisions so pacing and timing are absolutely crucial in the creative process the third very important element of film editing is rhythm there must be a rhythm to the editing for example here i'd like to talk about shot breakdowns when you break down a scene in cinema at least if you're going by the hollywood system you generally have a long shot then a medium shot and then a medium close shot you gradually enter into the scene now when the long shot occurs and you have the close up it would be out of rhythm to just give a close up and then quickly go back to the long shot unless the drama demands that it would be good to place one close up and another close up perfect balance and volume and then go back to the long shot this is the balance the shot breakdown and your editing pattern will determine the rhythm and this is what will give balance to your film use a close up let's say budaditto's close up 
and then there must be her close-up. It's important. These two close-ups will balance. And then maybe a long shot in which all of us are shown. And then maybe a track shot. So in the use of the moving shots and the static shots, in the interspersing of the close-ups and the long shots, there is a rhythm, a flow. This is what the editor will decide. I'd like to introduce two terms here. Uh, one I'd call synchronic and the other I'd call diachronic. Well, basically, the shots which have little or no, usually no element of movement, absolutely static shots with no elements of change, they're called synchronic shots. And those which have elements of movement, elements of change, they're called diachronic shots. Now, my question to you, before I conclude the episode, is can you name or give me an example of a diachronic shot in which there is no camera movement. In other words, there will be elements of change, but there will be no camera movement. Can you name such a diachronic shot? Think about it. What are the different elements of movement in a shot? What kind of movements can they be? Tell me. Panning. Yes, there could be panning, Do tilting, down, tracking, down. zooming, craning. But suppose none of these are there. The camera is static. Some element of change is there, which makes it diachronic. What could be that element of change, which is not a panning, tracking, or even a character moving? Can we do something with the focus? Zoom, yes. Zooming out. Or... Zooming also we are not doing. I asked you, can we do something with the focus? Is it um, lens, I mean, telephoto lens or... Suppose I use a telephoto lens, let's say. What can I do to the focus? Deep focus. If we don't have deep focus, if we have shallow focus, if we use a telephoto lens, then we can, what is known as rack focus or shift focus. The moment we shift focus, there is an element of change. We're using what is called rack focus or shift focus. That is, the focus is first on her, and then the focus is on you. It shifts. That's an element of change. So this is a diachronic shot. Now the editor, when he uses these diachronic shots, he must know where exactly to place them. Remember that a moving shot cuts well with the moving shot if they're of the same speed. Like in Alain René's uh, Hiroshima, my love, Hiroshima, mon amour. There are lots of these track shots some tracks in the city of Hiroshima. So near that, there are some track shots. That's in Japan. And he's cut to Nouvier in France because he's talking about a love story between a Japanese and a, a French lady played by Emmanuel Riva. Two cultures set against the backdrop of the war, you know, aftermath of the war in Hiroshima. And she's come to make a film about Hiroshima. And he says, you know nothing about Hiroshima. Do you know that it seemed as if 10,000 suns had erupted on that fateful day? Can you feel the pain that the people of Hiroshima did? And she says, I have felt another pain in Nouvier when she lost her love. So the pain of her love is juxtaposed with the pain of Hiroshima. So it's a wonderful text written by uh, Marguerite Dura, the famous nouvelle, nouvelle roman writer, who later went on to make films and directed by Alain René in that there are moving shots cut with moving shots. This is very important. You must take an aesthetic decision. Are you going to cut a moving shot with a moving shot? Or are you going to make the moving shot static and then cut to a static? Do you think static shots cut well only with static shots? These are creative decisions that you need to take, and they all relate to the rhythm. If you cut a moving with a static in a very haphazard way, it spoils the rhythm. In Alain René's Hiroshima Mon Amour, in his last year at Marian Bad, in his La Guerre Fini, the war is over, he maintains a kind of rhythm. It's very important that you maintain this rhythm. And this is one of the foremost creative exercises, how to maintain the rhythm of a film, be it a feature film, be it a short film, be it a telefilm or something for video. You have to maintain, you have to maintain the rhythm. We will continue in this vein 
in the next session, but have your questions ready. You may even ask questions which are outside what I've told you, but related to the concept of editing, because editing is becoming more and more complex, you know, with the advent of technology and with all kinds of effects being used. We must see that the effects don't become like a gun in our hands, because a gun can always be misused. Use the special effects with a, ju with, with, a, with a judicious mind. Don't overuse them as some of these music videos on MTV do. But that's a creative decision which all of us have to take. For the moment, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.